Hi guys, welcome to our last lecture capture for this weekend. I know it's been a lot, but I think you guys are going to be okay. Hey, Mr. Grumpy Gills. When life gets you down, you know what you gotta do? I don't wanna know what you gotta do. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. What do we do? We swim, swim. Dorino singing. Ha, 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 I love to swim in Dorino. When you want to swim, you want See, to See, I'm gonna get stuck fun. now with that song. Now it's in my head. Sorry. All right, guys, we can get through this. So again, just like last time, we're going to use <clears throat> a process to help explain some of these molecular techniques. So we're going to talk about producing recombinant proteins or making a protein uh, in another species. So for example, a cow protein, like the recombinant bovine growth hormone protein, in a bacteria. This could also be human insulin made in a bacteria or any of the drugs that are currently recombinant right now earth do we do that? So there's a bunch of steps involved in turning a cow gene into a recombinant gene in a bacterial cell. And remember, recombinant just means mixing two species DNA. So that would be bacterial DNA with cow DNA. Okay, so the R is the recombinant part, and it uh, would be a GMO or genetically engineered. Okay, so there's a bunch of steps involved in turning this cow gene into a recombinant gene, where we put cow DNA for this gene into bacterial DNA. First, we need to make a lot of copies or amplify the gene. How do we do that? Yes, with PCR. We've already talked about that. Today, we're going to talk about using restriction enzymes, <clears throat> and we're going to insert this cow gene into the bacterial DNA to result in recombinant we then need to put this DNA back into a bacteria and grow lots of these genetically engineered bacteria and then purify the cow protein that they're making for us. So let's get started. Okay, so first we're going to do PCR, right? PCR is replicating DNA in the laboratory in a test tube, lots and lots of copies. Then we're going to prepare this to insert into the bacterial DNA, right? When we've made the PCR fragment, right, Here's our little fragment. Originally, we had a primer this way and a primer this way to amplify this entire gene area. It's really difficult to clone something or put two pieces of DNA together that have a blunt end or no overhangs. It's much easier to use complementary base pairing or a double-stranded sticky end on a piece of DNA to insert into another sticky-ended or overhanged plasmid. So I'm going to show you how that works. So in this case, there's two restriction enzymes right here that will cut and leave a sticky end here and a sticky end here. If we cut a plasmid or a small piece of DNA, bacterial circular DNA, in the same way, then we'll have this complementary base pairing between the two new pieces to help us out. So here's how a restriction enzyme will cut, right? And we'll cut it like this, so it's uneven. And so now this is looking for a C, an A, a T, and a G. Well, look what's right here. Another N just like that, a G, a T, an A, and a C. So these two ends are compatible. They'll want to come back together. Remember, anytime two pieces of DNA that are single-stranded come near something else that's complementary, hydrogen bonding will happen, right? That's just chemistry. So these two pieces could come right back together that you just cut apart, or if we cut another piece of DNA with that same sticky end, those two pieces could come back apart. So let's check it out. Here's some examples of restriction enzymes and how they cut. I'm not going to ask you guys to memorize how a restriction enzyme specifically cuts. This is Hindi 3. No, I'm not going to ask you what its sequence is, but if I tell you it cuts like this, you should be able to show me the cut site like that. PVU2, another example, cuts blunt. Those aren't as good for cloning, but they can be used. We prefer not to do them. We try to use the enzymes that have sticky ends instead. So how does that work? We have two different pieces of DNA. We'll say this might be our cow DNA. This would be our bacterial DNA. We cut or digest both with Hindi 3, right? They leave Compati compatible sticky overhangs, and look, put those two guys close together in a test tube, 
with buffers and enzymes, and guess what happens? Complementary base pairing. So when they complementary base pair, right here and here are not phosphodiester bonded, right? The o only hydrogen bonding between these guys right here are holding them together. So what happens? In order to make this a, a stable connection, we need to make those phosphodiester bonds right there and there. And what enzyme, pray tell, seals or makes that phosphodiester bond with an existing 3 prime OH and an existing 5 prime phosphate? Hmm? Hmm? Who is it? Who is it? Yes! Yes! It's our good friend DNA ligase. So you have to add this to the test tube also. That's the enzyme that makes those right there, those phosphodiester bonds, to seal that a covalent linkage, not just those pieces held together by hydrogen bonding. Okay, so now that we have cut apart this little piece of gene with the sticky ends, we need to put it into that small bacterial plasmid, small circular DNA that's not part of the main bacterial DNA. Once we do that and put it back into a bacteria, now, well, once we do that, we have recombinant DNA. We have some cow, BGH, into bacterial small chromosome. Ta-da! Here's our plasmid, the bacterial small chromosome, which we also call a cloning vector because it take, can take up DNA. What does a cloning vector need to have? Well, it has to have these restriction enzyme sites in it, right? Here's that Hindi 3 that we saw before, which so if we could cut our insert DNA or our cow DNA with Hindi 3, we could also cut this plasmid with Hindi 3, leave sticky ends, and have a place to stick this little insert, the cow DNA, into our plasmid. What else do we need? Yes, yes, you named it, the origin of replication. Why do we need an origin of replication? If we want this bacterial plasmid to be put back into a bacteria and replicate and make lots and lots of copies of it, we need it to go through DNA replication. We need the normal uh, physiologic mechanism in a bacteria to replicate this plasmid for us, to make a whole bunch of it. What else? We need some kind of selectable marker, some way to be able to identify uh, a bacteria that has our plasmid versus one that doesn't, because when you try to jam this, back, this DNA back into bacteria, it's very inefficient. So if you have a billion bacteria, maybe 100 will take up this plasmid, we need to be able to find those 100. Selectable markers are generally some kind of uh, antibiotic resistance gene so that if they have the plasmid, they will grow even in the presence of antibiotics and all the other billion, only the 100 that have the plasmid will grow, the other billion will die, the only thing left on our plate that we can see would be the ones with our plasmid. Otherwise, this won't work at all. Okay, so here's just an example of a type of cloning vector. Here's our origin of replication to make, make sure we can do DNA replication and get lots of copies of this. Uh, here is our selectable marker. The selectable marker is, in this case, ampicillin resistance, so it can grow in ampicillin, which is a type of penicillin. So if you put this ampicillin in your agar plate, that you're the, the medium that you're going to grow the bacteria in, only bacteria that have our little plasmid will grow. Here's our restriction sites, our Hindi 3, and then this is just examples of a whole bunch of other ones that are available. Cloning, and then the other really nice thing about these types of cloning vectors is we also have um, these restriction sites in the middle of this LAC-Z gene, the LAC-Z gene um, makes beta-galactosidase, beta-galactosidase, which is an enzyme that when you um, give it its substrate and it cleaves it, it turns blue. So we have a promoter here that drives transcription and translation of this enzyme right there. And so if you give it the substrate, and this made uh, this whole 
um, protein, that enzyme will cleave the substrate and turn blue, and you actually get blue colonies. So the only time you get blue colonies is if there's no insert in here. Because our other problem is when we do the ligation, when we add the insert DNA, the cow DNA, into our bacterial plasmid, that's really inefficient also. So there's going to be lots of plasmid that have nothing in it, that look just like this guy, and are going to make beta-gal and turn colonies blue. Anybody that has an insert would disrupt this gene because there'll be a big insert in here, so we won't get transcription and translation of that guy, and we won't turn blue. Okay, we'll go back to that when we get there, too. So this is a really nice uh, cloning vector. So this is what we do. Here's our foreign DNA. That would be our cow, right? We cut each one with the same restriction enzyme. So in this case, echo R1 on both sides. It's going to give us sticky here, sticky here, sticky here, right? These are complementary. We're going to get complementary base pairing happening, right? At this point, they're just stuck by hydrogen bonds. When the ligase makes those uh, phosphodiester bonds. Now that's covalent. And these are stuck together. This is a full finished plasmid ready to go with our insert. So it would disrupt that LAC-Z gene. We would not make anything blue. All right. So let's do a practice using restriction enzymes, and as you can see here, you'll get the sequence of what the restriction enzyme cuts. So in the first instance, we're going to talk about an enzyme called RSA1, and it cuts between GT and AC. It's a four base cutter, right? and it has to have the correct polarity, 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And as you can see, most restriction enzymes are palindromes. A palindrome is the same forwards and reversed. So it's GTAC 5 to 3, right, going this way, and it's GTAC 5 to 3 going this way. And so this is what, how it will cut. And so in the first RSA1 example, cut the following strands of DNA using the following restriction enzyme. So if RSA1, we are going to look for a GTAC from 5 prime to 3 prime, right? So we'll, here's our 5 prime right there. So we'll be looking this way. We're looking for a GT, GT. Ooh, here's a GT. Is that it? Is that it? Nope. It's a GT, G, T, G. That is not our cut site. We need GTAC. So we're going to keep looking. <gasps> GTAC right there. And then we'll look on the other strand five. Yep. GTAC this way. GTAC this way. Our cut site is right here. Oops. Right there between those two. So that would be a blunt cutter. So we don't like that one for cloning, but we can use it. Okay, how about our other example? Let's look at the STY1. This one's a little more complicated. Its cut site is CCWWGG. That means the W could either be an A or a T or an A or a T. So we could look for CCAAGG, CCATGG, CCTTGG, etc., etc. Okay, so it's a little more difficult. It's a looser consensus, right? It's not doesn't have to be exactly the same for each one. So let's go ahead and look again. CCWWGG, this 5 prime to 3 prime, CCWGG, 5 prime to 3 prime. So let's look. So if we're looking, we're looking for two Gs, or excuse me, two Cs, the. Okay, here's CC, A or T, is that it? Yep, WW. GG, there we go. Let's look on the other strand. 5 prime to 3 prime, CC, AT, GG, yes. So then how does it cut, right? If we look here, this creates this big overhang. So our cut site for this guy would cut here, right? And then on this one, okay? So that's how it would cut, just like that. Nice work, people. Now it's your turn to do this example of restriction enzymes. In this case, you're trying to find a cut site for both RSA1 and STY1 in this same sequence. So what you need to do is show me the cut sites, just like I showed you, either a blunt cut site for RSA1 or a staggered or sticky-ended cut site for STY1. Label those, cut, and which one it is. Take a screenshot and upload to homework. 
Okay, take a break and do that, and we'll be right back. Now we have our plasmid with our insert inside. Here's our cow. Here's our bacteria. Right, it's got our origin. It's got our amp resistance gene. Here's our multi-cloning site. Right, it's interrupted that lac Z. No lac Z, right? Because there's this big cow insert in there. So now what do we do? We have to get this little plasmid that we now have in a test tube into a bacterial cell, back into the bacteria, so the bacteria can do DNA replication for us and make a whole crap load of this plasmid. Thank you, Ross Perot, for that. Yes, I can. Okay, so if we want to make this protein in a bacterial cell, which that's our whole point, we want to make this bovine growth hormone in a bacterial cell or our insulin, human insulin, in a bacterial cell to make a whole crap load of protein, we need a little bit different uh, type of vector, not just a plain cloning vector, we need an expression vector. And that includes operon sequences that allows DNA to be transcribed and translated efficiently. And so when we get to prokaryotic gene regulation, this will come back to you. We need a bacterial promoter, we need an operator, we need transcription initiation sequences, <clears throat> right? And we need a ribosome binding site, which as we know is the Scheindel-Garneau sequence, right? And then of course the restriction enzyme sites so that we can clone our insert right there. And then that sequence to terminate transcription, right? To make that little hairpin, remember that guy in our RNA that causes row-dependent or row-independent transcription termination? Yeah, all of that stuff. We need all that. Again, our selectable marker, some kind of antibiotic resistance, origin of replication. And then if we want to include stuff that turns on and off so we only express it, sometimes we can uh, mess with the operator. But we'll, we'll get to more of that stuff when we do prokaryotic gene regulation. So let's not worry about that right now. We just need to make sure we start transcription and we stop transcription appropriately so that we have this really nice um, RNA transcript, right? We'll make our nice RNA and then we'll make our protein from that, right? It has a Scheindel Garneau sequence in it, the first AUG, the stop etc. to make our protein so that our we end up with this cow protein made in a bacterial cell. All right, so now we have our intact plasmid, right? We've we've uh cut it with the restriction enzyme that matches the cut sites on our cow DNA. We do a ligation reaction. The ligase makes the phosphodiester bonds and makes it a complete and then we transform bacteria. We can use uh, electrical shock or we can use calcium salts to get the bacteria to take up our little plasmid. And then they're growing here, right, just in plain media with no antibiotics. So would they can grow up and start replicating their plasmid, do transcription and translation. They're making our cow BGH and they're also making our ampicillin resistance gene here. At this point, we then want to plate these bacteria, put them onto our media or our auger plate that has both ampicillin, right? So that will kill everything that does not have a plasmid. So the billion that didn't take up our plasmid will die. Only the, hun the 100 with our plasmid or will grow. And then Xcal, this is the substrate that our LAC-Z or our beta-galactosidase cleaves and turns things blue, okay? So anybody that does not have our insert, no insert is blue. So we don't want these colonies. We want to ignore them. So all those little blue guys are crap. They're just our plasmid resealed back together. That's blue. The white ones are our plasmid with our cow insert in it. Those are the ones we want. So we only pick white colonies. So as you can see on this plate, there's tons of colonies, more than 100, I don't know, maybe 1,000. We wouldn't want to screen through all of those to find the guys that have our insert, but this blue-white makes it super easy. See, there's only a few white ones. We only want to pick those and look to see if our insert's in there. 
So that helps us out a lot. So there we have it. We have it inside our bacteria. Now all we have to do is grow up this bacteria in our ampicillin media, right? And then purify away that bacterial pro that cow protein from there, right? It's made us a ton of proteins in there. All we need to do is separate that protein out, and now we have recombinant growth hormone, right? Why can we do this? Why can we get recombinant cow growth hormone from a bacteria? Because we use the same genetic code, right? Remember that whole universal? So bacteria can make a cow protein, it can make a human protein, any species can make any other species proteins because of this, right? Transcription's the same, translation's the same, genetic code's the same, all living things on the planet do this. Lots of proteins are made with this way, many, many drugs, most of the cancer drugs, all of the insulin that diabetics take, all the clotting factors for hemophiliacs are all made by recombinant DNA technology. Pretty awesome. Now we're going to quickly talk about creating a transgenic plant. We're going to use lots of the techniques so far. Again, another example of how we can use all of these techniques to create something that's agriculturally relevant, right? Make a GMO or a genetically modified organism. Lots and lots of agriculturally relevant plants, corn, soybeans, tobacco, are all genetically modified so that they use less water. They're resistant to bugs. We don't have to dump a bunch of pesticides on them. They grow better than the original. We don't need to dump a bunch of fertilizers on them. We can be better to our planet in that way. So let's take Again, we, in this case, we use a bacteria that naturally infects plant cells. It's called an agrobacterium. And so it has its own bacterial chromosome and little plasmid here, right, that if we insert the gene of interest, we can cause, it in this little plasmid, when the bacteria infects the cell, it actually will dump its DNA, that little plasmid, into the chromosome of the plant or into the genome of the plant, creating a transgenic, right, plant. So whatever species this came from is now part of the plant's genome. It will be replicated whenever mitosis happens, and it will be transcribed and translated and treated exactly like any of the other plasmids in that plant's genome. Pretty cool, huh? So here we go. This is how we do it, right? First, we're making our our plasmid vector. Again, we have to have an origin, selectable marker, restriction enzyme sites. Here's our foreign DNA. Insert into our plasmid. Use ligase to seal the phosphodiester bonds. In this case, this helper plasmid is necessary to get this other guy to go in there as well. And when we have this genetically modified agrobacterium infect a plant cell, it can it dumps its DNA into the plant chromosome, again, into that genome to be treated just like it would if it were its own gene. An example of that would be putting the Bt toxin into a tobacco plant. This helps um, kill uh, uh, bugs, pests, uh, any kind of insects that are going to attack the tobacco leaves. And so we build our plasmid, right, with, in this case, the selectable marker is neomycin, right? And so neomycin is another antibiotic, so that we know whether it's it, right? We'd make our plasmid, again, we have to have that promoter to build it, we have to have a poly A consensus sequence, right? Plants need that. And we've made this uh, expression vector, again, ligation reaction right there. And then this guy gets put into the agrobacterium. We get some recombination. It gets all fancy, right? This was the helper plasmid. Makes this guy that we can then, when this infects, jump in there. I'm not going to ask you all the details of this. This is just an example of how we can use this kind of cloning and expression technology in another way. Making transgenic plants, right? And then we infect these tobacco plants with this recombinant guy. Add in right, the neomycin resistance and uh, our Bt toxin in there, and we can select for the plant cells that actually took this up. And plant cloning is very easy, so we can select each individual single cells and then grow them up into an entire plant. So now we have a Bt toxin plant 
that is resistant to lots of pests, and that's going to grow a lot better, give us a much better harvest, use less pesticides, less bad for the environment. Another example is to create a transgenic animal using this kind of technology. And in the same way, we want that gene to insert into a chromosome of this animal so that it can be expressed as just like any other gene in the, uh, in the genome, right? We have to add some special sequences to keep the gene from being shut down and silenced, which we'll talk about when we get to eukaryotic gene regulation. So you have to make some fancy stuff but otherwise it works. So here we go, we've made our uh, gene of interest, right? This is in our plasmid and our expression plasmid with all the fancy stuff in it, right? We take a fertilized egg. What else is another name for a fertilized egg? A zygote, so the single cell at fertilization, right? We hold the little uh, egg cell that's been fertilized, we poke it with a teeny tiny little needle, and we insert our gene of interest or our plasmid of, in, plasmid of interest. This hopefully will integrate into the genome of that and then we essentially are doing IVF, put them into a pseudo-pregnant female, right? You have to have all the hormones so that the, um, the eggs will implant, right? So we did a whole bunch of these and plant them into the mouse and hopefully have offspring. Right, here's our offspring, and then we test them for the presence of this introduced gene. So whatever gene we put in there, we need to know if, if it actually got in there. Right? So some of the eggs will take up the gene and put it in the chromosome, and others won't. So what we do here is we extract DNA. We take a little piece of tissue, usually from the very tip of the tail, and we extract the DNA, and we do PCR, so we get DNA, and we do PCR, and then we do gel electrophoresis, and then we do southern blotting using a probe that matches this gene of interest, and we find out which of our babies have that transgene, and then we mate those two together, right? Because if they have the transgene, it's probably only on, in one chromosome. We want it on both. Because, right, two copies of every guy. So then we mate these two guys together and then look at their offspring for, again, for that foreign gene by same DNA, PCR, gel electrophoresis, southern blot. So that puts it all together from what we've been talking about this entire time. All of these techniques together to get a transgenic animal. And what kind of transgenic animal might you want? Well, you can study lots of different diseases. If you give a transgene for cystic fibrosis, right, to a mouse, then you've made a mouse model of cystic fibrosis. You can test drugs. You can look at uh, all the ramifications on the organs. And again, because we all are similar, I mean, mice aren't people, but they are mammals, and they are very similar, especially in their immune system, we can study lots and lots of different things. So I know that's been a lot. But I think you guys are good, and I will see you soon. Okay, that's it. Where are you guys? I'm going home. What a baby. Yeah, okay, Cartman. See you later.